morning. Glad to have visitors that are here with us this morning. Good to see Corey with us this morning and Savannah. I bet you're going to have a lot of fun at the camp this, this week. You know, there's some things that we, as Christians, are supposed to do, and we need to remember to be doing those things. There's also some things that a Christian better not ever do. And that's why I've entitled this morning's lesson, Some Things a Christian Better Not Ever Do. Now, we can go on down a long list of things and start checking them off, but I'll think a little more simple than that. If you'll turn with me to the book of Hebrews, we're going to take most of our lesson out of the book of Hebrews today. I want to share with you five important points that the writer of the book of Hebrews shares with us. It helps us to think and to realize what we need to be doing as Christians. The first important thing that we as Christians have done not ever do is disregard God's Word. Do not disregard God's Word. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. We'll start there. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. He's saying we better start paying attention. We better listen. We better read and study God's Word. We better do like David tells us in the Psalms and meditate on the Word of God. Let it become part of our heart. Let it become part of our daily living. Do as we are told in Deuteronomy. Let it be like frontless between the eyes, right upon our hands, on the doorposts of our homes. As we go about our daily lives, teaching our children from the time they get up to the time that they go to bed, let the Word be, of God be a part of our lives. Amen. Listen to what it's telling us. It says, give a more earnest heed, in other words, urgency. It's important that we pay attention to this. We don't know when God's going to return. We don't know who we're going to meet in our daily lives, who we might share the gospel with, who we might be setting an example for. Not only are we to teach others, but we're to save our own souls. What about the souls of our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, our family members, those who are special in our lives in some way or another? Do we want them to go to heaven too, don't we? Of course we do. And we need to give earnest heed to the word which we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them slip. In other words, get caught up in the daily routine. Well, the devil loves to confuse our lives. If you'll ever stop down, stop and think for a moment and sit down and start writing all the things that you need to get done today, and those of us that are still in part of the workforce or a school teacher, for instance, I can sit down and I can write you a list of things that I know I've got to get done, starting with school, all the things that my kids are participating in at school, the things that what Pam's going to be doing, things I need to be doing. If, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I can get caught up really easy. Think about that applied to other people in the world today. The things they need to be getting done, or things they might want to do, or things they, they've heard that they need to be doing. The devil loves to, to, to get caught up in the worldly things. Because then you can get trapped. And he loves to set traps for you. Listen to verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. He's saying that's how important God's word is. The angels desire to look into what we have, but they can't have it. They messed up. They spoke. They said the wrong thing, and now they're in trouble, but they can't fix it. And how much more for those of us who have been given this word, have been given the opportunity of salvation, if we neglect it, we let it slip away, we get tangled in the world around us. Beloved, we better not disregard 
God's Word in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Don't think of it so small, so insignificant as the greater portion of life. Beloved, it is life. Christ is the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. He is the only way. His is the only name under heaven whereby we can be saved. We better not ever disregard it in any way. Let it become insignificant compared to other parts of our life. Beloved, God is number one, always. He's number one in our lives when we're single. He's number one in our lives when we're married. He's number one in our lives every day. But he's always number one, beloved. We'll always be on the right path. We need to think about those things. Number two in the book of Hebrews. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. So we'll start. Don't doubt God's word. Oh, the devil loves to throw up that doubt. Maybe, uh, maybe that's not the way God meant for it to be. You know, you hear this as you go about talking to people out in the world, and oh, I don't think God really meant it that way, or I think God loves me; He'll understand. Are you sure? Or no? That's your interpretation of the scriptures. And I can remember sitting down talking with people and letting them read word for word from the Word of God. And show them what God's telling them, and they'll look right at my face and say, Well, that's your interpretation. I didn't say anything. The Word of God's the one talking to you. But that's what they like to do throw doubt. And that's the, one of the major weapons the, the devil has to use. It's one of, the, one of the persuasive things he used with Eve. Put a little doubt in there. Are you sure? Are you certain? Listen to what the Hebrew writer says. Take heed, pay attention, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And listen, pay attention, he's saying. If there's at any time, at any point, which you may have a little doubt, a little uncertainty, that will cause you to turn away from God back to the world or give heed and listen to some false doctrine, out in the world. What did Paul say in Galatians? I marvel that you're so soon removed from the, the gospel to another which isn't. Who hath bewitched you, he says. Who hath confused you. We need to pay attention to God's word. Don't doubt for a moment. Listen to what God is telling us. Verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is today. In other words, why you are alive today. You're not promised tomorrow. We can't do anything about yesterday. I can't go backwards in time. Time is progressive, always going forward. Motion. It never stops. I can't do anything about what even happened five minutes ago. I have nothing to do with what's tomorrow. I have no time. Tomorrow's not here. All I have is what? Now. And that's what the Hebrew writer is telling us right now. Take heed, pay attention, exhort one another daily while it is today, lest any of you be hardened through the what? Deceitfulness of sin. Sin is a lie, period. If it's not of the truth, it is a lie. Sin lies to you. Oh, you're going to have fun. Oh, this will be great. It'll be wonderful. It'll, nothing's going to happen to you. On and on and on and on. It's all a lie. And he doesn't want us to be deceived. Listen to what he says now. Turn with me to chapter 4, verse 11. Chapter 4, verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Beloved, if we don't study the Word of God every day, we don't listen to God's warnings, we don't heed His instructions, and we're lost, we're going to get in trouble. The devil is not a fool in the sense that he doesn't know how to tempt you or try you and test you and manipulate you and manipulate the world around you into believing whatever he wants. Stop for a moment and look around you at the world. Look how many people are being deceived on a daily <coughs> basis. And they're being deceived so proficiently that they don't even realize 
that they're being deceived. That is perfection. The devil is a father of lies, and he's very good at it. We need to not ever doubt God's word, ever. God says he loves you, believe it. God says he'll protect you, believe it. God's word tells you if you don't follow me and do as I instruct, then what? if it's not a faith, it's sin. Listen to what he's telling you. He's telling you don't listen to the world. Don't listen to a lie. Do what I have commanded you to do. If you love me, you will, John 14, 15. <clears throat> Number three. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. Starting with verse 4. <clears throat> Don't depart from God's Word. It must become a part of you. It must be in your heart. It must be a part of your life. It must be a part of your very existence. Every thought, every breath, every action you take must be reflective of who you are. You are a child of God, therefore you must reflect that in everything that you say and you do. Colossians 3 tells you very, very clearly. All that you do in word or deed, do as unto the Lord. Whatsoever your hand finds it to do, what do it heartily as what unto the Lord. I'm doing it for Him. That's the way we need to think. That's the way we need to be. Listen to what he says in Hebrews 6, starting with verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. Beloved, well, if we turn back to the world, if we start again back in the world where we came from, to live again, to follow after the same old habits and get comfortable with them again, it's not impossible for us to ever come back. Because why? We will not understand or see the significance of it. Can we repent? Can we come back? Yes. But beloved, when we wholeheartedly turn away from God and we willingly, the Bible tells us when we willfully sin, there remaineth no more sacrifice. I choose to go back into the world. I choose to turn my back on God. I choose to go back and to participate in those sins that I so much enjoyed in the past. I have made a point to do that. And I've made up already in my heart and mind who I'm going to follow. It is almost impossible to change some of them now. So what's the best advantage, the best means to not let that happen? Don't depart from God's Word. Don't stop studying it. Don't stop learning it. Don't stop letting it become part of your life. This is David. David talked about that the word be written upon the tables of my heart. Why on the heart? Because that's where my feelings and my thoughts and my emotions are. That's where the essence of who I am is. Let it become part of me. The Bible tells you us to be saved by the what engrafted word of God. To be engrafted means it becomes a part of who I am. I need to be the seed of Abraham. If we are obeyers of the gospel, we obey the gospel, we love God, we follow His word, that we are part of the seed of Abraham. We then are joint heirs with Christ for the kingdom of heaven. We're part of the promise. But I can't do that. I can't be there if I don't let the word of God guide me. That's why we need to study and understand in Psalms, especially in Psalms 119, it talks so much about the word of God, how we need to study it meditate upon it. What's the purpose of meditating? To let it think, think about it. Let it be, become part of your thoughts. What does Philippians tell us? Paul says basically the same thing. If, to, to focus your mind upon good things. 
If there's any virtue, any good from it, let your mind dwell on these things. In that same context, he says, let the mind of God, Christ be in you. What was Christ focused upon while he was here? He was focused upon doing the will of God. He was focused upon fulfilling the will. He, he had a purpose in mind. He had a purpose for being here, and that is you and I and everyone who would believe on Him. His purpose was to become a living sacrifice that through His sacrifice, he, we could be saved. He had a purpose. What is our purpose? Our purpose is to be pleasing to God. Our purpose is to bless Him and glorify Him acknowledge who He is. Our purpose is to be pleasing to Him. That's what Revelation tells us. He created all things for His what? Pleasure. How can I be a pleasure to God? How can I be fulfilling what God's asked me to do if I'm off doing what the world wants me to do? They're contrary to one another. You see? Don't depart from the Word of God. Let it become part of you. That's what it's intended to do. Plant the Word of God in your heart. Bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Live here and now a life worthy of the sacrifice made for you and I. Glorifying God because He loves you that much. See, God loves you so much. He said, here is how to escape the wrath to come. I love you. I want you to be with me. Here's how to do that. All we've got to do is listen and do and God will help us to do that. Number four in the book of Hebrews. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, starting with verse 26. Don't despise God's Word. Oh, there's so many times that I've seen through the years talking with people and teaching people and trying to help people learn about God and about His Word that I have seen people get angry I don't want to do that. Why do I have to do that? Why did God make it the way that I have to do this? I want to go fishing today. This is my only free day. I want to go to the lake. I want to go to the softball games. My kids are in softball and they need to go. And the only time they have games is on church night. You'd be surprised at the things that I have heard. And people get angry. And her anger is at the Word of God, which convicts them and says, you need to be doing what God says to do. Beloved, we can't despise God's Word. We can't get angry with God's Word. Because in the end, what does that really mean? It means that you are focused on you and not on God. The Word of God is telling you you can't do something you really want to do and you're mad about it. Beloved, that's not a heart devoted to God. That's the heart devoted to me, myself, and I. Listen to what Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. That means you're no longer in God's grace. You have made a choice. I want to go back into the world. I want to go back out and do what I want to do. No God will understand. He knows what my heart is. I love Him, but I enjoy doing this. Or I want to go do that. If you'll notice and pay attention, every situation involved with sin, beloved, starts with I. I want to go do that. I want to enjoy that. I think, I want, I believe. It all starts with I. It doesn't start with God wants, God desires. There's a big difference, isn't it? We cannot willfully turn our back on God's Word and go do what we want to do. Listen to more what he says. But here's what is contrary to that, or goes along with it, actually. A certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He's talking about the wrath of God. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. 
And if you go back and you look at the Old Testament, you'll find where that took place. If they defied Moses' law, then they were presented before the, the uh, elders and they made the decision, yes, it's fine. And they took them out and they stoned them to death. Why is this here? It's because this is an example to you and to I and whoever else will study the Word of God and pay attention. God says, do what I'm telling you to do. If you don't, you will be punished. That's what He's saying. By an example and by statement. This is in verse 29. Of how much sore or greater or worse punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. In other words, taken the gift of the Son of God and said that's not good enough. I'm not going to pay attention to that and throws it underfoot. No, to do what? To do what I want to do. Who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant. What is that? That's Christ's blood. It's a blood covenant we have, Hebrews tells us, with God. It is the Son of God's blood that makes that covenant what it is. Wherewith he was sanctified, that is, those who have obeyed the gospel. An unholy thing. In other words, no longer is it precious in your sight. No longer do we want to count it as what we do when we partake of the Lord's Supper. It's no longer meaningful to me anymore. And have done or gone and sinned and done what you want to do despite of the Spirit of grace. What God's saying here is how much, if those who disobeyed the law were stoned, how much greater a punishment are you worthy of if you take the gift of the Son of God as a propitiation for your sins, an opportunity for you to become a child of God, join heirs with Him for the kingdom of heaven, be called sons of God, and to live eternally in heaven with Him. Look at the what God's giving you. And you take that and say, that's not worth anything. I want to do what I want to do. How much greater punishment do you think that person would deserve? That's what God's saying. And you can understand then the statement, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Beloved, when judgment takes place, when we stand before God, there's no court of appeals. I can't say I changed my mind. No, it's over. And you made your decision because of the how you live and the choices you make while what? We read it a while ago. While it's today. Today I can make up my mind to do what's right. Today I can change any wrongs I've done. Today I can choose to follow God. Today I can be a child of God. I can come home again or I can make a decision to have my sins removed by baptism. Today I can make a right decision. I can't do anything about tomorrow. And I can't do anything about what I did before. But today I can make a good decision. Now, one more. Look in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. This is something a child of God better not ever do. Don't disagree with God's Word. Don't disagree with it. Listen to what the Hebrew writer says. See that you refuse him not that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Don't turn away from God. Don't say, well, I don't think that's the, what God really meant, or that's not what God really says. Oh, how many times have we heard it? When we've tried to talk to people about God's word and said, this is what we're commanded to do. This is what God wants. He's telling us. And then we'll find someone and say, well, I don't think He'll care if I do this. I don't think God will mind if I do this because He knows I'm doing it for Him. Beloved God, 
very clearly tells us in Acts chapter 17, God is not worshipped with men hands as though he needed anything. But he's worshipped in the temple, beloved, in that we are the temple, Paul tells us in Corinthians. He, we are worshipping God right now. We are all priests, Peter tells us. We are all set up and set in and ready to give spiritual sacrifices because our worship is spiritual, not physical. We need to be doing things God's way, the way God commanded it to do. We need to quit despising God's word and saying that's not what God really meant. Or thinking that we're equal to God and saying, I think God meant this when he said that. Beloved, God doesn't give us a word that's hard to understand. He doesn't give us a word that we can't comprehend. He doesn't give us a command that we cannot obey. God loves us. And all He tells us to do, all He asks us to do, is love Him back and demonstrate that love by obeying His word. <clears throat> and how easy is that? These are five things that a Christian better not do. So let's start now at the close of this lesson. Let's, do, let's talk about something we all better do. We all better bow our knee now while we can. Love God while we can. Worship God while we can. Obey God while we can. And live a life worthy of the sacrifice He made for you and I and all who would believe. If you're here this morning, you need to put your Lord on in baptism. Now is an opportunity that we extend for you to do that. If you're here this morning and you need prayers to the church, you need to respond to the Lord's invitation for whatever need you may have that we can assist you with. And we love you. God certainly does. Let us help you in whatever way we can while we're together. We stand and invite you in song.